If you attended the education show BET this year in London, you will definitely have spotted our guest today, Rachel Jones. She is curator and collaborative author of Don't Change the Light Bulbs, and she is going to be discussing with us the challenge of rolling out technology across the curriculum. Inspiration for Teachers podcast, bringing you dynamic and inspirational educator interviews. Our fascinating guests share their professional challenges and creative resolutions for success. Discover their workable strategies, ideas, and resources to reach your educational goals. And now your host, Kelly Long. Welcome to Inspiration for Teachers. I'm so glad that I finally managed to get you on the show. Before we go into your personal challenge and, and what you're going to delve into with us, could you just start off by telling our listeners a little bit about you? Yeah, sure. Um, I'm a, an e-learning coordinator in a secondary school in Southampton in, in the UK. My job is basically to help assist the rollout of one-to-one technology in the school. But I also teach uh, IT and classics, which is a, a you know very well-trodden career path, not so much. <laughs> um, so I do that and um, helping teachers grow their confidence helping staff see how they can use technology meaningfully. Um, We also have a prep school, so I get to work with children from age three all the way up to 18, which I think is a massive privilege and um, something I've really enjoyed. On the show, Rachel, I very much like to get your immediate feedback on a question that really interests me. How can we use technology to support children with special educational needs? Because I know that there are some amazing apps out there, but how can we utilise it more effectively? I think that teachers often forget that devices like iPads actually have a lot of inbuilt features that will help children with SEND needs. So things like the voice recorder, things like, you know, holding down and highlighting and it will read you out the word. So the Theosaurus, I think there's a lot of inbuilt features actually on, on things like iPads that really help, well, all children actually that, that don't necessarily need it. Things like podcasting, I think, appeals to everybody and that everybody has an equal right to, to have student voice and to be able to, ha- to be heard. I think that's a lovely thing to do. Things like using Book Creator, where you can type the content, but you can also record, you know, audio. So you can say, well, you know, you can write a shorter brief, but then explain what you meant in greater detail in terms of just using a kind of audio file. I think is really empowering. And I certainly think if I'd have had that at school, it would have had a massive impact on my engagement because I wouldn't have felt limited by what I could get down on paper in the lesson. You know, you can actually talk your way through. And I'm, I'm relatively articulate. You know, I'm better now, but when I was younger, I wasn't so good on paper. And it would have given me that chance to be able to express what I thought properly. And those kind of Things that have that flexibility about how students express their learning, I think, is is really valuable. Because I do find that with people that have dyslexia, that they very much are good at articulating exactly what they understand. But the second that you're asking them to produce written work, that's where it all falls down. And to penalise somebody because they can't do that, I think it's a very narrow view. That's the, the joy of podcasting or video blogging, that students can talk through and explain their ideas. And like Einstein said, if you can explain something, then you understand it. I just think we need to relish that more as an education system. There's so many exciting things going on. I think it's just an amazing time. I mean, I don't underestimate the challenges that we face, and there are lots and lots of them. But it's such an exciting time to be in this profession and to make some real changes that are going to impact on people's lives. It's just awesome. Yeah, I agree. I I think this is the best job in the world. You know, Vic Goddard's right. There's no other job where you get to go in and every day is completely different and you face different challenges. But ultimately, you're you're looking at, you know, helping people achieve the, you know, the best of their potential. And that's that's something that's really amazing. At the start of every show, we always ask a question that will inspire and, and motivate people. And just to get your insights into what excites you right now about the teaching profession. I mean, I see a lot. I'm really lucky that my job is I, I get told to go to conferences. I get told to go to events. I get told to go to other schools and see what they're doing. But I think the most exciting thing for me is looking at change in my own school and seeing how, you know, we've got this technology rollout. We're in the first year of our iPad rollout. So our year sevens and year nines have got iPads now. And um, just seeing teachers being willing to take risks with their own teaching, um, being, you know, not entirely accepting, but understanding that it doesn't always work. 
um, and being prepared to try again the next day, being prepared to ask the kids for help when they need it, being prepared to, you know, change the way they practice, even though it's been very successful in terms of attainment, is just the most inspiring thing. And I'm so lucky to be able to walk down the corridors and see people doing things every day they would never have done a year ago. Have you found much resistance to that? Um, well, there's a few, I mean, there's a few teachers who are resistant, but I think if you can demonstrate to teachers that the impact is to the benefit of the students, most, you know, well, all good teachers will will see that that's a good thing. And, you know, if you if you can demonstrate that you're helping people to learn and to attain and to achieve, I mean, what, what teacher is going to really stand, you know, in the way of that? I think when I started my job, there was one teacher who was using his iPad as a bookmark. <laughs> um, and now he's using it to demonstrate augmented reality. It's just showing people how it benefits them and trying to sort of play those angles. So is it going to save you time? Is it going to help your marketing? Is it going to help? The way that you engage learners, is it going to help your planning? Is it going to help? So just looking at what, you know, what will help teachers see it as being a positive thing and then show them how to go about making that happen. And did you have to give them lots of training and, and was there a lot of CPD behind that? I mean, I'm relatively new, so I, th- I would have been there a year in Easter. And I think before I got there, it was two, three years of trials and training. So since I've been at school, um, we've had two insets and they've been based around giving teachers time and, you know, the space to to almost play with the apps and to get used to using them and see how they'd be able to implement them to have impact in terms of their teaching. So we did, um, you know, teacher toolkits talks about takeaway homework. We did um, takeaway CPD. So we gave all the teachers a menu of CPD, like there was a starter. And there were lots of little activities, like little starter things, a main, which was something a bit harder and a dessert, like a something like a challenge activity. And they had um, the time in the session to learn to do different, um, you know, IT based activities that they thought would be of use to them. So we allowed teachers to self differentiate and um, choose activities that would benefit their own teaching practice. And we've had those kind of insets, which have been brilliant, but with teachers setting up Padlet walls or using QR codes or you know, using Google Classroom for the first time or learning how to share a Google Doc. And, and everyone was on different stages, but they were all doing things that they could then take away and, and use. Alongside that, we did the NACE uh, Risk It uh, Challenge, which was to try using technology in your classroom without the kind of fear of failure, you know, with a good B plan so the kids don't, you know, lose out. And that was really powerful. So we had people trying podcasting and video blogging and and slightly, you know, more complex tasks that gives the students work a public audience. So we've been pretty lucky, really, in how we've sort of had the time and space to be able to to train people. And I'm only 50 percent teaching. So if people need me to come and help them in their classroom or just stand at the back and make sure things work, I'm there to do that for them as well. So it's um, it's been pretty good. And now we're going to do the flip side of that coin, which is. If there was an aspect of teaching or education, large or small, what would you most like to change? I think in terms of something I'd change, I think exams. I don't think that exams are a fair reflection of students' ability or potential and that schools push kids through exams for league tables, for, you know, for for point scoring, for recruitment, for all the other reasons. And I'm not sure that, that the outcome is always in the best interest of the kids. Well, how else can you do it until someone, you know, invents a mind reading machine? We're just forcing kids to do things. It's jumping through hoops. It's really difficult now as well with changing or making so many changes to the BTEC qualifications that the only route for a child is through doing an exam. And that's not always the best method of testing knowledge. No, not at all. And every qualification seems to be being devalued and that, you know, things that a few years ago meant something and was important nowadays don't don't seem to me as much and it's it's just really disheartening for the kids taking it and for the teachers that are doing all the pushing because their jobs rely on it and I I just worry that we're we're not equipping learners for kind of a, a lifetime of being successful and having to go on and do future learning. Do you know what I think that's really true and it's it's even spreading up the chain because I was talking to Charlotte a senior lecturer at the University of Portsmouth and she was saying that when they get students through they essentially just want to know how to pass an exam yeah I don't know how much the kind of exam focused approach is is really working but it's a thing that we measure and the thing that can lead kids on to to better lives and it's it's just a very difficult judgment call 
It is. I think this is going to be an ongoing conversation for a very long time. We're going to move on to your professional challenge. And could you share and give our listeners a, an outline as to what that is? And then we'll move on to how you resolve that. Yeah, sure. I mean, my school is a, an independent school and the results are very, very good. We have a lot of students taking three sciences and maths, very level. It's a very um, high performing school. And I think my challenge really was to demonstrate to teachers why they needed to change their practice um, when they were already very successful with the results that they had. And actually, in many ways, I think it's still a work in progress. I've The kids have only had the technology since September, so we won't see the outcomes for what five seven years it's really heartening to walk down corridors like the maths corridor and see teachers using using padlet using the apps on their ipad using google apps for education for students to collaborate and do things so i think it's not so much that i've overcome it but just that it's a journey and i'm seeing that people are taking steps with me and that's really encouraging and really heartening and and i know that it will have impact on their attainment in the long run even if it's not in terms of you know the the letter that they get for their exams they might still just get an a star but they will be better learners when they go to university and i think that's really encouraging so how did you go about planning that i mean there must have been a structure there must have been some evaluation as to what needed to happen and and how it needed to happen so if another school wanted to adopt a similar approach how do they even start with that right well we get i mean we get a lot of um we call them like ipad tourists come to school to talk to us about that actually and um my my line manager, who's Bob Allen, who's fantastic, is the chap that hired me. And he had the vision to kind of say that we needed to have one to one technology in school. And I was kind of employed to make it happen. And um, I think it's very difficult to go to another school and import what they're doing wholesale, because what works in one school doesn't always work in another. So we chose iPads after a couple of years of trials, but another school might choose, you know, Surface tablets or Chromebooks or whatever's appropriate for them or just, you know, BYOD, whatever works. But I think it's just been really helpful having a supportive senior leadership team who value, you know, we have Twilight CPD who value encouraging people to to keep using the technology and, and all those kind of things because it's, it's really staff buy-in that makes it happen. Um, and if the staff aren't interested and won't use it, it's, it's not going to happen. So, um, it's making it about demonstrating to the staff how it's going to be useful for their students. And I think that that's what the school's done really successfully. I see on Twitter lots and lots of conversations about technology and how schools can waste money implementing technology. So if you were to give a five step plan as to what is important, how do you do it properly? I think really the the, the way to make it happen is to get buy in from all the different stakeholders that are involved. So First of all, your senior leadership team need to drive it and need to be behind you. To be honest, they might there might be members of the team that don't even entirely understand, but they need to be supportive and have you know a lead role in helping support staff to do that would be kind of step one. I guess step two would be engaging um, parents. So we've done a lot of parent training, lots of late nights, um, showing parents how the technology will be used, what e-safety will be in place, how the Wi-Fi filtering works you know, what cloud storage means, all those kind of questions. Um, so it'll be kind of a step two parents. Um, step three would be pupil engagement, I guess. That phrase, digital natives, is a complete farce. Kids are really good at using Instagram, but they don't understand what Google Drive is. So doing training with the students themselves, talking them through how to use the apps when they're useful, when they're beneficial, when iPad use is appropriate and when it's not. Step four, I guess, would be um, teaching, teaching staff. So having quality, um, you know, CPD, that teachers have someone that can support them and, and help them grow their practice in a positive way um, and be on hand to help. And I guess step five is governors, because ultimately, if they don't say yes, nothing happens. So um, it's about engaging those those five different stakeholders and, and helping them, you know, work towards a common aim that's going to actually ultimately really benefit the school. That's such a big process, isn't it? <laughs> it is a massive process. And it's one that the school, I mean, before I was there, it took, I think, three years of research and trialling different devices and, and working with different groups of people to, to help them, you know, work together so that we had a shared vision for how technology worked. And it wasn't just something that was being forced on people. And you said you brought in outside organisations to support you. Who were they and how did they help? I ran quite a lot of the the training now um, in terms of CPD and Twilight but before I was there we had Tablet Academy come and do some training with staff before I was there because you know they needed to have that 
we still um, employ people to come and do, uh, do child net, do e-safety talks, particularly for parents. I think it's just a case of recognising, like, I'm good at what I do, but I can't do everything as well as some people can. And that that's OK. <laughs> and um, there are people who are expert in their field who will then share their resources and help us develop our PSHE programme and things like that to help us make the best use of what we've got. You know, it's all right to be honest about what you can do and it's OK to, to ask for help and, and look for support if it's not your area of expertise. So like, you know, we've got a maths department who are a fantastic maths department, but that's not my subject area. So it's OK to, to look for outside support, you know, if they want math specific CPD and that's fine, you know, because they need to develop as practitioners as well. So, you know, it's a good thing to do. And you must be seeing some really creative outcomes now that your staff are trained and they're using it confidently in the classroom. Absolutely. So um, our DT department in particular have been sort of leading lights of using technology. And they're using things like the 1, 2, 3D catch design apps so that students can kind of conceptualise their apps online before they actually go and make the product, which is amazing. Biology department have been using augmented reality so that when students scan bits of their, you know, their worksheets or their other things, because there is, I mean, you know, paper content alongside. They get taken to video content they've made where the heart beats. They can watch the heartbeat as they read about it, which I think is amazing. We do extended studies, which is where they kind of, um, you know, they have a the, the first year's go off timetable and they've been doing video blogging, podcasting. They've been writing collaborative music and garage band. There's some really amazing things. But alongside that kind of really good practice, like uh, classics teachers um, using blogging to give their students work a public audience. So there's some really inspiring things going on. It's just a really great place to be, watching people flourish and try new things and and then see that it works and kind of run with it. It's lovely. That's really excellent because a lot of those skills that you're talking about are skills that employers want and are always saying that we're not developing in schools because our, our curriculum is narrowing and isn't really evolving. So it's really good that you're doing that and seeing that kind of progress. It's been really inspiring and it's been kind of borne out in lesson observations and things um, that people are taking a really positive approach to how they use the technology. And it's it's having a really good impact on students attainment, which is lovely. What a great way to differentiate your lesson. Exactly. It's, It's been fantastic. Moving on to our inspiration round is your opportunity, Rachel, to share with our listeners your best educational resources all of which can be found on our website at inspirationforteachers.com. But first, let's get a bit personal. And can you share with us your proudest moment? Oh, well, my my boys, I've got uh, an eight-year-old and a five-year-old. And I, you know, I've been a single parent for two years and they're, they're the thing I'm most proud of. They're lovely and they amazing and after that it's the book and I never thought I'd get to write a book I'm quite severely dyslexic and to even make one happen um has been a privilege and something that I'll you know never forget what is the best advice you have ever been given that has helped you in your teaching teaching is very all-consuming so look after yourself and um and, and accept help when you need it mental health for teachers and mindset is a real important issue and it's very, I think it's very undervalued and people don't really address it. And we always thrash ourselves, don't we? And by the time half term comes around, we're all dead. If you're staggering into work and you're not really well enough to, to give the best that the kids deserve, you're, you're not giving them what they need. So it's, it's quite important. Now moving on to your personal sources of inspiration. So that could be a person, it could be somebody in the profession, it could be something going on in the online world. Uh, the Pedigree uh, website is fantastic. It's a website for teachers who don't have their own blog. And that has, you know, posts from all different, you know, kind of cross subject, cross curricular, cross section teachers is a fantastic source of inspiration. But beyond that, I think just using social media as a teacher has been fantastic. And none of this, none of the things I've done in the last, you know, two years would have happened without me being brave enough to share what I do in the classroom. So encouraging people to you know use twitter or google plus or staff room or whatever platform they want to use and and share what you do and and kind of have faith that it's good enough and that other people will be interested in joining that dialogue i think people are quite fearful of social media and i'm not entirely sure why that is i don't know whether it's because teachers have been put off by it with all the the internet safety or simply they don't know how to use it but it really expands your 
professionalism in terms of how you listen to what other people are doing and you might try this and you might try that and I mean personally for me I think it's just enhanced my teaching practice. No absolutely I think we've got sort of dual professionalism haven't we? we've got our subject area of professionalism but we've also got our pedagogical area of professionalism and like reading some of the posts about you know feedback and and questioning and things just things that I would have never got to on my own ever and it's it's been just a revelation looking at how other people think even if it confirmed that I don't think like them and I do what I do because I I believe in that um and it has been really useful and really kind of affirming so it's good so let's move on to a personal teaching or educational habit that works for you time and again for me I think my my entire classroom practice is based on me having respect for the students as individuals and them respecting me so if I say to them we're going to live tweet this lesson they don't muck about they don't like tweet anything ridiculous and when I deal with them I don't talk down to them I don't patronize them I deal with them as individuals and as adults and people well not adults but children that you know potentially vulnerable and need your support but also children that need nourishing and need growing and and need all that input so it's about having that two-way mutual respect I think really helps a classroom kind of thrive and, and do well and it gets over some really difficult hurdles, doesn't it? You never know what baggage a child is bringing with them fully to a lesson. And if you've got that mutual respect and you're approachable, I think it helps to break down some tough barriers. Absolutely. And, I'm, you know, I know it's not particularly trendy, but I think a child sort of centred approach where it's not about you, it's about them, is something that's really useful in terms of aiding their learning. And it's something that I believe in. And that's kind of, you know, what I've taken with me from 12 years of teaching. Oh, I totally agree with you. So now we're moving on to this question of a resource that you can share with our listeners. So it could be internet, it could be a book, it could be anything that you think would be of value. Um, the book is probably the second best thing I've ever done, aside from my children. So um, I um, I went to the Google Teacher Academy, not this year, last year, and we had to do a public outcomes project that wasn't to do with our own educational community. And lots of the American people that went had these brilliant ideas when they got there and they thought it all through. And I had a bit of a panic and didn't know what to do. So I set up some um, Google Forms and I started asking people that I really rated or people that were really good in their subject area to fill them in with their sort of 10 best ideas for their subject or for, you know, particular pedagogy like questioning or feedback or. And then Crown House Publishing got wind of what was kind of happening and and offered to to kind of publish the book. And that was really exciting. And um, I always wanted to to write a book it was on my my kind of my bucket list of things to do and it did snowball a bit we ended up with I think about 80 contributors um wow. people, <laughs> yeah people that were fantastic and very inspiring people that I look up to and people that had never I'd never thought would say yes but everyone I asked said yes so it was great and so the book is um don't change the light bulbs and last week it was number one in the education chart Amazon which was like the best feeling ever because all the money for the book goes towards um, action for children and they do uh, food banks in schools and deprived areas so um, it's kind of like this thing of doing some good in the professional world and doing some good in the real world and it's just been like an amazing I I kind of can't believe it I got to do it it's been lovely (laughs) and I've got that book and it is awesome but for those people that haven't bought it yet what can they expect from reading it okay so um all the people that I asked are experts or what I consider you know, kind of people that have had a lifetime of practice or have had a long time of practice or are influential in their area. Um, they're subject uh, specific kind of areas like, you know, maths and English and, and all that kind of stuff, geography and all that things. Um, there's also sort of general pedagogy. There's tips for NQTs, tips for governors for dealing with parents so I tried to make it as comprehensive as possible um sort of 10 tips in that area each page has been individually designed to reflect the ideas that the author had so each page looks completely different and is really beautiful and unique and the book is is just lovely it's the sort of thing you can sit down with for five minutes and just read one page and take away something that then you can implement the next day because I don't think teachers have enough time to be able to sit down and read a whole chapter or a whole book and make sense of it often you know unless you're really good and you can do a whole John Hattie in one go which I can't I pretty much audiobook everything that I can get my hands on because it's the only way I can cram it in exactly so it was a way of, of making CPD digestible for teachers and also um, accessible because I think a lot of teachers might even be on Twitter 
some of them, I guess, but they probably don't get the time to go through and trawl through all the blogs. So it was the best of all those things could offer. And I was just really lucky that so many amazing people like, you know, John Tomset, Vic Goddard and Chokazar and all these awesome people agreed to help me make the book happen. And it was it was just a privilege to kind of be the person that got to make it, you know, work. It was just a one good idea that happened to come together, I think. <laughs> and tell me about Pinterest. Pinterest. If there was a support group for Pinterest addiction, I'd be, <laughs> I'd be behind you. <laughs> Pinterest is kind of known for being an American site, which is about food and wedding dresses, but actually is a massive educational community on there. So you can pin, which means save JPEGs, which have a link to the original URL. It's basically a way of curating research. Um, so my students do a lot of using Pinterest to begin research projects. But for me, you can find other people's ideas. I put my ideas back on there, but you can also import content from other media sources. So I had a GCSE group who were importing content from degree level articles, which I thought was fantastic. And then they can go back and there's no worries about plagiarism because they've got the web address. And it's just this fantastic way of learning through using pictures. And it's a good way to store your brain, isn't it? Yeah, every idea. There's such inspiring creative people on there as well. I think it's a fantastic resource. And um, yeah, Pinterest is completely where it's at. <laughs> I'm high-fiving you, Rachel, over the internet. Hey, <laughs> Before we say goodbye, Rachel, a huge thanks for joining me on the show today. We've learned so much from you. Please tell our listeners how they can connect with you. People can find me on Twitter. I'm at RLJ1981. Or you can find my blog is createinnovateexplore.com or if you just want to email me. Thank you for joining us today on Inspiration for Teachers. For more resources, tips and advice, visit our website, inspirationforteachers.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, we would love to connect with you. Just click like on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash inspirationforteachers. 